Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hi, everyone. Casey Berman from Love or Leave the Law podcast. Welcome back to this episode. So happy to have you. Um, Adam Olette, my co-host, is here. Uh, we also have a very, very special guest, Kate Neville, that I'm about to introduce that we're going to hear from today. Um, everyone, as I always say and as I always mean, really, really appreciate you being part of the community. So happy to have you as a listener, as a viewer, and just part of the podcast, as part of our Facebook group again. Um, on behalf of Adam and all of our guests, thank you. Yes. Okay, let's dive into this week. We have Kate Neville from uh, the DC area. Kate, how are you? Welcome. Thank you. I'm good, thanks. I am very excited to have Kate. Um, Kate, you know, I've been blogging and writing since 2009 uh, in this space about helping attorneys leave the law. Um, now Adam and I have started talking about uh, re helping them refresh their practice and, and love the law again. Kate's been doing this for, for over 10 years. Uh, it's someone when I first got into this, knew about, people have always said, oh yeah, Kate, she's over in DC. We've communicated via email, we've talked. Uh, and it, it's just so happy to have Kate here. Real quickly, Kate, Harvard educated attorney, 10 years providing uh, help to attorneys and broader professionals now in, in leaving uh, their current job for a better job job. Um, and also she's expanded her practice recently, which we're going to dive into, into preparing and helping them kind of refresh and love their current job. Or as you move to another job, helping them, people like yourself really plan about how to really excel there. Uh, she's got practice uh, uh, in, pra she's practiced in the law, um, worked in management consulting, worked a for-profit, non-profit, just a wide breadth of, of experience. And um, Kate, let me know if there's anything I missed, but just so happy to have you here. Great. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Great. Real quickly, tell us a bit. I know um, your practice right now, we were talking earlier about kind of some new things that you're doing. Maybe just add to the intro uh, a minute or two. Um, and really give a, a kind of hone down what, what your focus is and really how you're helping professionals, attorneys, as well as I know other professionals out there. Sure, of course. I mean, I'm an attorney by background, as you know. Um, so when I started doing this, that was specific. I knew there was a need for lawyers thinking about what their options might look like. Yeah. And that a lot of us, myself included, went to law school because we weren't sure what else to do. And everyone said, oh, it'll keep your options open. But That's I think right. it proved to be, as we all know, harder to actually figure out what those options are and how to pursue them effectively. And so that's what I set out to do. Um, and that's then great. over the last 10 years, kind of helping people think through both the big picture, well, I know I hate this job, but I don't know what else I would be doing, right. as well as kind of more the technical piece of how do I articulate my skills? How do they translate to different That's things? right. How do I market myself, whether it's on LinkedIn or in writing in a bio or even at a conference? Um, and so what I found is now that I've had my own practice 10 years is people have come back when either they're ready to make another move or they're finding challenges in their next job yeah. that unfortunately they also faced in their previous job. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of what I've done, and I'd say even from the beginning, because you're not going to get a new job tomorrow, right? So how do you manage a difficult work situation yeah. while you're in it? And if you're looking for another job at the same time, how do you layer that on? But even if you're not, how do you navigate jerks in the workplace right. law is not the only one that has those, right? That's right. As well as managing your own responsibilities when you're asked to do something new, managing other people is often yeah. something people come into other um, positions, but you know, not just lawyers, a lot of people get promoted to management because they're good at what they did before yeah. not right. because they know how to manage. And so it there's some kind of understanding that people are just supposed to sprout those skills overnight and it doesn't happen. You know, one thing that I think there's, it's hugely valuable and I just want to respond to it. First of all, I went to law school because I was a Jewish kid who didn't like blood. I didn't go to medical school. I didn't think much about, right. I just, I just went, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I was LA law in the eighties and my grandfather was a lawyer way back when, and, and you just sort of did it right. And I've seen this with a lot of other 
uh, ethnic or religious or familial type. Like my family was just lawyers or, you know, just that's what Indian kids do or Chinese or Irish or you, know, you just see it and you think about like, people spend more time thinking about the gadget they want to buy than law school and the investment so much more. And it's, we laugh about it, but it's kind of crazy that X years later, there's this disconnect, right? As to why am I not happy practicing? So I think it's valuable. And I think the other thing that really resonates with me, and I want you to just expand on a bit more is I see this at leave law behind a lot is I help people leave the law. Many people will say, well, just what's the job? Where, where am I going to go? Casey? Where should I? And I would say, don't focus on the J word. We have to look inward, kind of what I call your unique genius, what you those skills and strengths yeah. and let that inform. And I think many attorneys that I work with, they're not patient enough or they don't really want to do that. They want to know, just tell me where I'm going. The problem with that is they go into a fill the blank biz dev job or tech job or something, and they're doing it for the same reasons they went to law school, stature, security, money, because it's hip, whatever it is. And then they end up six months not really enjoying it because they didn't do that internal work, right? Do, do you see that? Absolutely. And I agree. Yeah. You have to have the internal conversation before you start having the external conversation. And, you know, you don't want to come across when you, you know, networking is part of it regardless. But yeah. if you aren't able to articulate, so what is it that you're interested in? Well, I don't know. I might do X. Yeah. I might do Y. I mean, you obviously have to have a better uh, answer than that. However, you don't have to have the same answer for everybody you're speaking with. That's and right. I think there's absolutely no substitute for talking to people to figure out what it is that they That's actually right. enjoy about their work. And you have to be careful that you're not speaking in canned answers and canned That's questions. Right. Be thoughtful about it, you right? So, so Kate, I want to ask you a question and everyone, we're going to post her information, but Kate's at nevillecareerconsulting.com, N-E-V-I-L-L-E careerconsulting.com. We'll mention this a few more times. Email us if, if you ever want to get in touch, but feel free to get in touch. Kate, Kate question. Finding out what we're good at, understanding that. Everyone nods their head and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, a, it, it takes time. B, it, it's not that it's hard, but you have to really focus energy and think. And three, the point that I might talk about is like, it can get a little touchy-feely, woo-woo. And, and you have to kind of be courageous. I mean, you may think you're good at things that you're really not. Uh, you have to kind of get inter internalized. You have to meditate. You know, all this sort of touchy-feely new age right. stuff. How, but ultimately, it leads to a very tangible result, empirical, that, that attorneys like. How, can you give some tips as to how people can really internalize and, and do this internal work without kind of feeling, without it being uncomfortable for them? You know what I mean? Woo -woo, right. Yeah. Exactly. It's interesting. I just gave a talk on emotional intelligence and how mm -hmm. in-house counsel can use it to their advantage. Shoot. Because Perfect. EI is referring to it that way. In the business literature and business schools, it is always up there as a critical yeah. skill for yeah. leadership and career advancement. You almost never hear about that. In That's right. It, it just, it is considered kind of woo-woo or touchy-feely. And it's like, all right, so... I feel like a lot of what I do is bring to lawyers and other skeptical audiences kind of what is it you can take away from that that could add value yeah. to how you're feeling because right. I too was am continue to be often but was very skeptical about that kind of thing but I have seen it really produce results that yeah. just linear thinking isn't going to get you there. That's right. People who That's are right. very smart, very logical, they should be able to figure this out. And you get very hard on yourself. And it's like, all right, take a deep breath, right? Because right. getting frustrated with it is not going to help you with the process. That's right. And there are steps you can take, but you need to be in the right frame of mind and be willing to go outside your comfort zone. That's right. That's for that. sure. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen in, there's a number of links, we'll put them up in the show notes, where major publications, I think Forbes and so on, I'll share it, where they've talked about how, the, it was a great headline, why English majors are, uh, are needed and wanted in demand in Silicon Valley. And the whole point was to sell, to market, to connect with your customers. Mm. Whether you sell iPhones or whether you sell B2B software, whatever it is, there's a narrative you need to create. There's exactly. connecting with the emotions of the customers. And I think that's kind of the same thing that you're helping the, your professionals do. 
and I do talk about narratives explicitly, kind yeah. of what is your narrative, right? Yeah. And how do you kind of not say, oh, I'm in a career transition, because it sounds like you want to do something totally different that you have no experience doing, but want to get paid for. And that's, that's right. not really how you market yourself. That's and so right. what is the narrative that kind of has a line through it where yeah. you say, I've done X and Y, and what I've really gained from that is A, B, and C, right. and I can apply it in this context in D, E, and F, or, and that's a lot to know, right? Yeah. You have to be willing to ask those questions, but you're going to be in a much better position in a job interview if you've had some of these conversations with people more informally. That's so right. in my view, it's posing a hypothesis. Why do you think you would be good at this, right? That's good. So can, if you can't answer that question yourself, why are you wasting someone else's time, right? So there, it's a research exercise. And a lot of lawyers are very good at research, even yeah. English, you know, whatever your major was. Yeah. If, a lot of people find that a much more comfortable framework. It's like, there's really not another way to get this information, right. but you have to do your homework first. So I want to get to loving the law and refreshing. Before we do, the point you just made is, is huge. And I have worked with a woman in her mid forties, three kids was in uh, litigation and just was dying. Like, I can't believe I'm going to do another trial until mm -hmm. I'm 65 and her yep. skills, we were able to, and I, and I know you do this, Kate, we were able to reposition her skills, hurting the cats of a 10 month long trial and, 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 you know, nurturing and mentoring younger attorneys and attention to detail as applicable for logistics and operations. And so mm -hmm. now she's at a tech company kind of getting things that sells things online from point A to B to C. There was another big law litigator, very personable and flamboyant and just great energy who's just rotting at this big law firm. And now uh, he's an editor. Uh, he's got a team. He gets to write. He gets to edit. He gets to be creative and not think inside the box. And it's just, it's this way of taking normal legal skills, rethinking them and saying, you know what, this may be applicable to other jobs, which is beyond just transactional litigation Absolutely. or Absolutely. academic, right? It's crazy. And I think anyone who's been an associate at a firm has got some project management experience. No yeah. one ever calls it that. But if you're managing up to the partner, right. managing down, yeah. whether it's paralegals, summer associates, that yeah. kind of thing, managing out not only to clients, but to vendors, what if contract That's attorneys, right. that kind of thing, that is project management. For Here's sure. our deliverable due date. How do we back it up? And what it was, who has to do what to get us there? Yeah. D deadlines. Uh, putting out fires, upselling client. I mean, yeah. on and on. That's project management. That yeah, there's loads of moving parts in, in most yeah. of anything attorneys do. So for sure, I, I love that. Yeah. And I don't think most attorneys even realize that that's part of their skill set, and and it's important. Absolutely. They don't even know a project management jobs exist. Mm -hmm. Gabe Rothman. Or to talk about it as a skill. Right? That's right. Someone I helped, Gabe Rothman, he's on my website. He talks about, he's been on the podcast before and he said the exact same thing that you're able to get from point A all the way to point M and everywhere in between. So, Right, he, and with very sophisticated clients often. Right. These are not people who, you know, are just fine if it takes an extra day, right? Their sure. timelines, there's a lot of pressure. And if you know how to interact with those types of clients and can produce right. under that kind of Sure. That, that's a skill. That's a value that you add. Now, Kate, talk to us about the person who says, you know, my skills and strengths, I don't want to leave the law. I love the law. Um, it's what I want to do, but I'm just, I'm just not liking it now. I'm in a funk. Um, I'm not connecting. How have you been able to refresh, rehabilitate, or get people kind of reconnected with their law practice Speak, if, if that's really where kind of their soul, their passion, and their, their skills should really be. Sure. And I think to some extent, it's the same approach in terms of what are the skills, not only that you have, but that you enjoy using. Right. So litigators, they're great litigators out there, and they produce great ex um, results, and they're you know, fire in the belly, except it makes them ill. I yeah. mean, at the end of a trial, they get very sick. They yeah. have family issues, you know, whatever it is. And so how do they translate those skills, getting up in front of a sophisticated audience, their persuasive arguments, they, you, know, you don't have to call them arguments if it's outside of a courtroom context, but 
is that also, you know, negotiation, mediation? I mean, that would be kind of the more closely related legal right. jobs. And then a lot of people want to get out of a law firm environment. And sometimes yeah. that's a grass is always greener kind of thing. Like, right. oh, this is all I know. So just get me out. Just get right. me out. And then, you know, different workplaces have different pros and cons. But I think if you're able, maybe it's a different size law firm. I mean, you really got to get to what is it you want to get away from. Right. So is it different colleagues? Is it, you know, maybe the devil you know is better right. than the devil you don't know? Is right. it kind of, there's no real, really for you to go up, even though you've quote unquote made partner, no one's right. shifting there. Um, or is it that you really want one client you could advise over time yeah. rather than kind of being the external hired gun? And so right. are there different contexts that you might apply your legal skills? And then, you know, Sometimes uh, compliance, although people roll their eyes when I say compliance, it can be an interesting job. It depends yeah. on what the role is, right? Break yeah. it down. Investigations is another one, kind of internal investigations. Are those in the GC's office or are right. those outside of it? Right. And does that have to be determinative? But right. in terms of the stature questions that you mentioned at the beginning, I think it's important to be honest with yourself. I mean, if it really is important to you to have lawyer as your identity and you're not going to be comfortable saying, oh, well, I do X. I mean, think about that. How broadly can you push that envelope? Because That's you right. could say, I'm a lawyer. I do internal investigations or, That's right. you know, I advise on X, Y, and Z, but it depends. Is it important to you to have that lawyer identity or not? Some people are like, I'll do anything but, and it That's really right. just depends. That's right. Yeah, I mean, Casey talks a lot about that in his work, and we have we have discussed that quite a bit in the podcast in terms of, you know, giving up that ESQ as you're under the name or, or not, or, or keeping it as part of what you're doing, because it does lend a lot of skills to any kind of career. And, and that's the thing that most attorneys don't understand is that we bring so many skills from being a lawyer that the, the fact of the matter is that they're marketable skills. And, and Casey's done a great job over the, the past 20 some episodes of, of alerting people to that. And it's, most people just aren't open to anything translating into a different job. And so let, I really want to talk, uh, Casey's been uh, monopolizing the time at this point. So <laughs> <laughs> I got to bust his butt a little bit. I, but I, I want to, I want to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe maybe you need to interview her for another hour after I, I we're think done. So. I, I think you may. Need to. Well, Kate, no, you guys think, have so you have so much I, I, in, in common I, in terms of what you do. I, I, I we'll have you back, Kate. We're going to have you back for another one. Definitely, definitely. Great. But, yeah. I'd be happy to. Kate sent us uh, one of the first or second drafts of an article she wrote, and she entitles it Eight Things You Need to Know for Professional Satisfaction in the Current Economy." And we were uh, lucky enough to get this article before we, we interviewed her. And one of the things I want to do is ask her a few questions from this and, and then we'll wrap up because this article, everybody needs to read this. Everybody listening needs to read this. And as soon as she gets it done and, and finalized, we will send it out to everybody on, on the list and we'll put it in our show notes if that's okay with you, Kate. Absolutely. Um, we did, we, number one is work that's interesting to you and uses your skills. We've touched on that. Casey has been asking you some questions about. Let's move to number two, a job that pays you enough not to worry about money. You know, how can the, our listeners and, and people that are, are with us in this podcast, how can they uh, come up with a, a way and figure out what, what they need to live and then how much money they really want to, to make so that they don't ever have to worry about money? Because for me, I know the people that I consult with and, and even friends, the, their biggest problem is worrying that they're not going to be able to pay their house payment, pay their bills. And when you get past those fears, there is so much on the other side of that. And then for me, I've always known, yeah, when I was worried about those things, it never happened, but the worry almost capped the income I was making because that was where my focus was going. And so when I started opening up to making more money and then money came in, it's, it's almost like a dual-edged sword to where when you're worried about it, it doesn't come as much. And then when you stop worrying about it and you put all your focus on your marketing right. or, or making more money or different ideas, things start to open up in massive ways. So t talk to us about yeah. how you advise your clients. Sure. And, you know, again, I think everybody has to identify what trade-offs they're willing to accept That's because right. in my view, as I say in the article, there is no one job that is your dream job, maybe in a few cases, but for most of us, you know, people say, 
pick your passion and you'll always be, you know, happy and prosperous, but that's not always the case. What if your passion isn't actually going to produce an income? So that's not particularly helpful advice in my view, but I agree with you also that to look at something from a mindset of what they call scarcity, scarcity like, mindset. oh, I'm not going to have enough, I'm not going to have enough, doesn't really let your best self come That's out right. and let you really think about how you might market yourself to do something. I do think part of it is a number crunchy exercise, and it's different depending on what point in your career, right? So if you've still got law school debt, you know, either get back in touch with the powers that be at law school if you need introductions to people who could help you refinance and look at what that might look like, whether it's deferment, whether it's a smaller amount over time, or, you know, now I think the public interest trade off 10 years of your life. And then maybe if your law school has the program, they'll forgive your debt. But 10 years is a long time. If you don't want to work in government or for a nonprofit, think about whether or not yeah. that trade off is really worth it. a big chunk. It, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so if there are kind of ways you can either negotiate, I mean, it depends. Somebody's going to have more funding sources available to them through family or others, but they don't want to have to ask for that. Yeah, but true. if it's having to ask for that, maybe it's a loan and structuring it a way that you can feel okay about asking for that kind right. of help. Others just say no, and they set a budget so that you can work at a high paying job if you're in a big firm and not spend it all. I mean, in my experience, if you're in a job like that, that you hate, you spend a lot spend of money to all. make yourself feel better, right? That's you're right. going to eat yeah. out at fancy restaurants. You're going to take extravagant vacations. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about going to Africa on safari versus like the Jersey Shore. I yeah. mean, there are ways to cut back if you're feeling not as depleted at the end of every day in right. your work life. So right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did that. I, I bought big cars and bought a lot of stuff right. because I really wasn't liking what I was doing. And it's a kind of a way to self-soothe self and, and eat good food and eat too much of it and overindulge. And it doesn't, that doesn't work in the long run. It's, uh, and, and then you don't have any money to show for it after all those years. And then you still have student loans and you rack up debt. So it's, uh, this, this is, an, this is a, the number two is, is so important, I feel, in, in our lives in general. And Casey, I know you have a, a few things you want to ask her about this uh, topic as well. Yeah, so um, numbers. I do, I, I think it's huge. Part of where I help people leave the laws is, is is getting an Excel sheet out. But attorneys, you know, we're not MBAs. We're not uh, data scientists. Uh, we don't use Excel. Many of us don't use Excel that often. We use Word right. or maybe PowerPoint. How do you, many of them not only have money issues, a scarcity issue or so on, but they, they, it's hard for us to budget and plan. We just aren't that best, with, that good with numbers. How do you, how do you get a comfort level with something with this? Right. I mean, I think, it's fair enough to say, you know, I didn't need to do numbers, so why should I hold myself to an expectation that I should be doing right. this? Yeah. And again, kind of, if you can approach it as a learning exercise. So now there are more resources than there were, you know, back, certainly I'm dating myself, right. I was in law school a long time ago, but, you know, even LinkedIn has started these mini videos, have you seen those, like 101, Accounting 101. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. of course, a lot of universities have, financial management and right. other types of courses. Now, I'm not sure you need accounting necessarily for your own personal budget, yeah, no. but there are books out there that, and I don't know about, you know, family ma or sorry, financial management for dummies, but there are ones about advising your student as they go off to college, yeah. advising your emerging professional. Why not start there? There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Agreed. And then, you know, you can categorize. And I think it's important to do it sooner rather than later. Because once you start having conversations with people, you need to anticipate the question. So what are you looking to make? But, and you, oh, I don't know. It's awkward. Maybe I, you will have to see. What do they pay? Right. You no, know, you want to have a range at least in your head. You know, obviously it's going to depend on what the specific job is. Um, right. But I, you know, the other thing is to turn it into a question. You're not asking the person what they make, but to say, you know, I'd be really, it would be helpful to hear kind of what would you say the range is for someone coming into this type of work right. at my level, right. because that's yeah. the best salary data you're going to get. I mean, there yeah. is salary.com, there is glassdoor.com, yeah. but 
that's how you're going to actually be able to negotiate your salary effectively in a job interview is if you've gotten these data points. And then you know what you, yeah, know exactly what you need to live and then how much money do you want to put away? And that's, that's the, the thing that nobody does. It's so interesting that nobody takes a look at, well, where can I cut back on expenses? Do I really need Netflix or do I need a gym member? Whatever it is, can I go out and like Casey loves to be outside and so do I run hiking and stuff like that. So nobody looks at these things. And I think when you look at things under a microscope, there is a lot of things that I cut back a couple years ago. uh, What am I doing all this for? I'm working so hard to pay all this stuff. And then I made a decision. Enough's enough. Let me have a lifestyle that is aligned with who I want to be, but it doesn't need to be showy with the, with all the crap. And, and we, you know, the more stuff we have, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the right. more Adam, I know, we have. I'll, I'll let you jump to the next, to the next point of, of Kate's article. But the, I just wanted to say that I've seen a two, two or three examples of clients. They, they were leaving the law job. They loved, they were about to, they were just so excited about starting it. They love their unique genius or narrative and so on, but it paid less. It paid substantially less, but I'll tell you, they were able to make it work because there is nothing like the potential, the opportunity to be happy and to have a great job and to see this new future. There's nothing like that to force you to really assess your expenses. And all of a sudden you go, you know what? I can cut that. My spouse can do this. My partner can help me with this. We'll do this. We'll make it work. And in all three examples, I've talked to them recently. They love their life. They made some cuts, but they're able to do it. And we had an Excel sheet. We laid it all out and it just, it was happiness versus money. Yeah. And I think, you know, one way to look at it is what is 24 seven worth to you, That's right. right? If it's really going to, and what is your hourly rate? Yeah. If you actually look at what you're paid and divide it over the number right. of hours you're actually working is another right. helpful way to look at it. Then also you have to be sure that you're comparing apples to apples yeah. because, you know, whether not just vacation, but other types of benefits. I mean, people, a lot of lawyers haven't really looked for a job before because they've been in one job for quite right. some time. Mm. And so really delve into what a package offers and right. whether it's a startup and there's going to be p- potential equity involved right. or it's a university and they've got tuition assistance. I mean, right. you know, there are many different ways. The other thing is what are your priorities? There yeah. are some yeah. working parents who say, you know, yeah, I'm going to have to take a $50,000 pay cut, but you know, I'd take more than that because I have flexibility. It's like flexibility is worth hundreds of thousands. That's of dollars. right. It's true. It's true. There's a whole movement of simplifying your life. There's books being written. There's yeah. documentaries on uh, all over the place on Netflix. No less. We talked about Netflix before, but I've been watching these things that people are moving into these tiny houses, which I'm six, nine. I can't fit in a tiny okay. house. I'm, you know, but but <laughs> yeah, the fact is we, work. what we did a few years ago, my wife and I, we, we have horses and we were living in Florida for a long time. And well, most of my life. And it was so expensive to have horses there. And I always wanted to move up to North Carolina and have some land. And we, we cut our expenses by 80% and have the same size house and a lifestyle that's even better than we had before. And yeah. so, you know, we, we looked at it and said, what are we doing this for? Why are yeah. we paying this yeah. exorbitant amount of taxes? And, you know, I know you, Kate, you live in Washington, D.C. And Casey, you, you live in San Francisco. So my heart goes out to both yeah. of you. But, but, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> let's but move right, on. It's a, and that's a lot of people end up going to an area with a cheaper cost of living. And it yeah. seems very difficult. I mean, but Peoria, you know, companies in Peoria know they have to treat their people sure. well gotta, because they got to recruit them and keep them there. Yeah, that's right. right. Yep. Yeah, it, it's yeah. all kinds of trade-offs. I just think it's being very clear about what your priorities are. That, that's that. a big one. I, I love it. I love it. Hey there, this interview is not over. This is the end of part one. Part two will continue next week. So make sure you join us for the continuation of this amazing interview. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.